program you're about to see is a deep background examination of George Bush, his underlying assumptions, his political pedigree, the philosophical outlook which governs his actions. It is a far different picture than the one you're accustomed to seeing, but it is compiled from publicly available sources. The speaker is Harley Schlanger, Southwest Coordinator for Lyndon LaRouche. Mr. Schlanger was a candidate in the Democratic primary of 1990 for the Senate seat currently held by Phil Graham and received 250,000 votes, approximately 25%, although he was opposed by the media and Democratic Party bureaucracy. Mr. Schlanger will address the question, who really is George Bush? If you have any questions or would like some complimentary literature on the material being covered, please call the number that will appear on your screen. At this moment, George Bush is riding high, sitting tall in the saddle doing his best imitation of John Wayne. The polls are telling him he's very popular, one of the most popular presidents we've ever had. His coalition that was put together, maybe it was put together with bribes, with cheating, with threats, with blackmail, but it held together. And the coalition forces did defeat the army of Saddam Hussein. And so George Bush is riding high. He may not be the education president that he promised. He may not be the balance, the budget president that he promised he would be. He may not be the anti-drug president, but he did prove that he can deploy one half million American military personnel with the most advanced weapons in the world, and that those people can smash an army of a nation of 17 million people. And so George Bush is riding high. Lyndon LaRouche made the point several weeks ago that one of the most dangerous possibilities for the United States and for the world would be if George Bush gets a quick victory over Iraq. Now, why is that? Why is that such a threat? What we're going to look at is this question of what happens now. What happens now that Bush is high in the saddle with a feeling of euphoria, with the New York Times saying Bush has the aura of invincibility about him. What will Bush do now? What's behind this, this man, George Bush? And will he deliver with his promise of a new world order? The most important point to understand is that this new world order is not new. It's not a new idea at all. In fact, it's modeled precisely on the empire established under Rome and rebuilt by the British with their naval power in the 17th and 18th century. And that today, Bush, using his vaunted air power, is intending to replicate with his sidekicks, in fact, with his bosses, the British, this Roman Empire reincarnated as the British Empire, reincarnated today as a new Anglo-American Empire. And from the start, let there be no mistake, this was not a concoction of George Bush. But step by step, he was led by Maggie Thatcher and by one of the key British elements who's been undermining the morality of this country for years, and that is Henry A. Kissinger. And that is the real story behind the so-called New World Empire. It's a repeat of classic colonial policy. Now, what do I mean when I say colonial policy? There are a lot of people who say, well, imperialism, isn't that a communist term or a sociological term? Are you saying that Bush is a new imperialist? And if so, what does that mean? Well, the essence of colonial policy is the idea that a nation with a strong military is able to impose its will on all other nations. And that will, in particular, is an economic will. 
That is, that the colonial power, Rome at the beginning of our modern era, Britain in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, that that colonial power demands loot from the colonies, in particular, cheap raw materials. Today it's oil. In the past, it's been other commodities. But secondly, cheap labor. That is that if you look at the essence of the American economy today, what do you see? We're an economy becoming increasingly like the British economy, a shattered basket case, with our infrastructure declining our highway system collapsing, our railroad system collapsing, our air transport system collapsing, our hospitals and healthcare system are collapsing and are scheduled for increased cuts under this new budget. By the way, you remember President Bush promised no new taxes. And then when he broke that promise, he said, well, we'll bring the budget deficit under control. Well, the budget deficit that he promised last September, which he said would be 200 to 220 billion will probably be 350 to 400 to possibly 450 billion dollars. More than double the largest deficit ever for the United States. That's why I say George Bush is not the president who's ending the budget deficit. But this idea of trying to get cheap labor and cheap raw materials to prop up a collapsing economic infrastructure in this country and a collapsing banking system is at the heart of the need for Bush to establish a successful colonial policy. Now there's another aspect to this, which is defined by the dictatorship of financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, that in addition to squeezing cheap raw materials and cheap labor from the developing sector, from the third world, Bush's policy includes imposing on those nations draconian austerity, which is properly called genocidal austerity. Because in order to pay the debt, the nations of the third world are forced to take food from the mouths of their children. They're forced, as in the case of Brazil today, to allow diseases to spread, insect-borne diseases, because there's not the money made available to them to spray the insects. Or in the case of Iraq today, post-war Iraq, there are reports coming out of Baghdad of the spread of cholera, of the spread of other waterborne diseases, because the water system was destroyed by Bush's bombing. The electrical system of Baghdad was destroyed. It may take a year to provide electric power to parts of the city of Baghdad. Unless, of course, they get Houston lighting and power involved, in which case it might take two to three years. Now, this is what we mean when we talk about genocide imposed by international financial institutions such as the International Monetary Fund as part of the new colonial policy. And the final aspect of this neo-colonial policy, which includes the other three points, the cheap raw materials, cheap labor, and subservience to these financial institutions, is that there is no national sovereignty allowed under the New World Order. That any leader who stands up for the interests of his people above the interests of the International Monetary Fund or the World Health Organization or one of these groups will be shot down just as quickly as George Bush and his military capabilities can be deployed to destroy that leader. This is the neo-colonial policy of Bush, of Kissinger, and of the Anglo-American financial interests who they represent. Now the premise that they are operating under for the present period is that they've resolved the East-West crisis, that the Cold War is over, there's no longer a problem with the Russians. And therefore, as Bush has said, as Baker has said, as Kissinger, Brzezinski, all these other geopolitical talking heads that you see on all these talk shows, they've all said we now have a unipolar world that is only one power. And the Russians have to march to our drumbeat. 
And since we dominate this world militarily, we might as well prove it. We might as well show it. And so Bush refused to negotiate over this takeover of Kuwait by the Iraqis. He sabotaged every attempt to negotiate. He sent in half a million troops. We leveled whole sections of Iraq. We carried out a war that was totally one-sided from the start. And we demonstrated what? We demonstrated that in the new world order, there is no room for any nation which disagrees with the dictates of the chief colonial powers. And when Gorbachev tried to intervene, tried to make some statements to bring about a ceasefire, he was totally rebuffed as though the Soviets are no longer a power. When the Pope tried to intervene, he was rebuffed. Bush had no room in his new world order for an attempt at a peaceful settlement. Now, there have been some warnings released recently about this situation by Lyndon LaRouche from his prison cell in Rochester, Minnesota, where he's kept by George Bush. Lyndon LaRouche is George Bush's political prisoner. But LaRouche has been warning that Bush has made a mistake with this premise. That is, that there's no longer a threat from the Soviets. What LaRouche has said is you cannot overlook the Soviets in this present situation. That in fact, the crisis facing the Soviets is a devastating internal economic crisis, which can't be solved internally. How will the Russians react in this present period? They've asked for credits. They've asked for help. And what Bush has done has, has been to offer them the International Monetary Fund. Bush has sent a stream of economists who are economists of the sort that worked in the, running the concentration camps for Nazi Germany. People like Jeffrey Sachs, who's been in Poland, destroying what's left of that country's economy. And what they say to the Russians is if you're willing to sacrifice and undergo austerity, we might help you out. And what they intend to do is buy up Russian industry cheaply. And the Russians will not accept that. We're already seeing reactions from within Russia, a rejection of that policy. Not simply a rejection of that, but a rejection of the arms control agreements as the Russian military is beginning to reassert themselves. And if you think that the Russian military likes to hear talk of a unipolar world, of a world in which the Russians are no more than a third world power and the US is the only superpower, then you don't understand the mentality of the Russian nationalist. The present alliance running Russia is the KGB, the military, and nationalists. And Gorbachev is, at this point at least, either a captive or a leader of this group. And what they're saying is that all the arms control agreements that were negotiated by Shevardnadze are out the window. They're saying, look at the Gulf. What does this tell you? That we Russians must not give up our offensive military posture. And so within Russia, there's a rumbling of this old Cold War bear threatening its own people in the republics, such as the Baltic republics, Azerbaijan and elsewhere, threatening the newly liberated states of Europe. There are still 50,000 Russian troops in Poland, and they're not leaving. There are over 350,000 troops in eastern Germany, and they're not leaving. And so LaRouche said that because of this economic crisis, and because of Bush's newfound macho, that Bush thinks he's put the wimp image to rest over the corpses in Iraq, that because of that, the Russians are getting more desperate and more angry. <clears throat> and this danger, there's a new danger of war that stems from this. It's not simply a neo-Cold War or Cold War II, as William Sapphire called it, but it's a possibility at some point in the next year or two that the Soviets will reassert themselves. And one of LaRouche's warnings is to watch what's going on in the Korean Peninsula, where the, the military of North Korea, which is a Soviet puppet state, has been on a full-scale alert in recent days. <clears throat>
So because of this economic crisis, you have a renewed war danger. It's also the case, as can be proven very easily, that this neo-colonial policy will not solve the US economic crisis. That no matter how cheaply we can get oil from Saudi Arabia, no matter how cheaply we can get steel from Brazil or Guatemala, we are not going to be able to rebuild our roads, our education system, our health care system. We're not going to be able to educate our students to the level as necessary. We're not going to be able to reindustrialize based on loot taken from the new colonies in George Bush's New World Order. So the economic crisis in the West, if we continue with Bush's policies, these rabid free trade, as he calls them, free trade policies, which are the old policies of the British Empire in the 18th century, of Adam Smith, promoted today by that, that snake oil salesman, Phil Graham, the senator from Texas, that these policies will not solve the economic crisis here, and so we will be impelled toward more wars over raw materials in the future in George Bush's New World Order. This is what Lyndon LaRouche has warned from his prison cell, where he's being kept by George Bush. And yet Bush and his admirers are paying no attention to this. They're praising themselves. General Schwarzkopf practically broke his arm patting himself on the back yesterday for the brilliant job he did. He said something like, uh, to use the word brilliant to describe our military operations would be a stupendous understatement. Lyndon LaRouche put it a little bit differently. He said, what this military maneuver proved is that a 250-pound sodomist can take advantage of a six-year-old child. That's what we saw in the Gulf War this week. And yet Bush and his admirers are out there praising themselves and they're happy. One of the spokesmen for this crowd is a man named Sir Peregrine Wursthorn, who is a British lord knighted recently by the Queen, who's the editor of a publication called the Daily Telegraph, which is one of the most popular, most widely read newspapers in Great Britain. Wursthorn says in his editorials what George Bush and his friends really think. Let me read you a couple selections from recent editorials from this uh, Peregrine Wursthorn, who, by the way, is the illegitimate child of Sir Montague Norman, who was the British representative, the head of the Bank of England, at the time when he was endorsing the takeover in Germany of Adolf Hitler. That's Sir Peregrine's bloodline. So on Febru February 10th, he wrote an editorial headlined, Bravo for American Power. Now listen to the words, because this is what Bush and his people are really thinking. There is no common interest between the first world, that is the Anglo-Americans, and the third world. We are envied both materially and non-materially, and the third world would dearly love to pull us down. Nothing blocks this aim except Western strength. The aim must be for America to win an overwhelming victory, for Western technology to prove devastatingly superior. And he continues. It is beginning to look as if Saddam Hussein has given the West a chance once again to establish its unchallengeable preeminence. Not only will our arms have prevailed in a most spectacular fashion, so also will our ideals, said Peregrine Worst Turn. Nothing is ever forever. Sooner or later, the third world will throw up other challenges. But if the Gulf War ends as it has begun, there can be no doubt who are the masters now, at any rate, for another generation. We have the laser beams, and they have not. And the we who matter are not the Germans, or the Japanese, or the Russians, but the Americans and the British. Happy days are here again. Unquote from Sir Peregrine Wurstor the editor of the Daily Telegraph, the Queen's favorite paper, speaking on behalf of George Bush's New World Order. Now here's another editorial from a week later. Same publication, 
Uh, this one's titled, Rely on Fear, Not Love. And for those people who are Arabs, listen particularly to the hostility and the bellicosity aimed by this editorial. The only thing the Arabs, and especially Saddam Hussein, understand is force. Therefore, it will take force to curb the ambitions of Arab nationalism and fundamentalism in general. Nobody should underestimate the pressure that will be placed on America and Britain after the war not to exploit their rights of conquest. In the Middle East, however, Western imperialism is exactly what is needed as never before. Continuing this editorial of February 16th, it says, the Anglo-Americans have gone back to the brave new post-imperial age. The Gulf's oil reserves remain one of the world's great strategic prizes. Someone is going to lay hands upon them before the century is out. The Soviet Union, Germany, Japan, or a new Saddam Hussein. Why, now that we are in position to do so, should the US and Britain not reassert the strategic control over them that we once possessed? If this involves the occupation of Baghdad and the dismemberment of that country, we should not shrink from the task. We would have the right to do so, as we had the right 70 years ago to dismember the Ottoman Empire, the right of conquest. Might makes right. That is the editorial of the Sunday Telegraph expressing the point of view of the British oligarchy and the American establishment figures who have allied themselves with them in this new world order. That is the point of view of George Bush. And that's why it is absolutely accurate to say that this new world order is a repeat of the old Brit uh, British colonial order. Now to see George Bush arm in arm with these kind of raving British colonialists is a kind of thing that would have George Washington spinning in his grave. In this sense, it's completely accurate to say that George Bush has taken on the role of George III, who was the enemy of the American Revolution. That is George III, who fought to keep the American colonies under British control. And in this sense, Lyndon LaRouche, who's been jailed by Bush, is playing the role of George Washington, trying to reassert the principles of the American Revolution. Don't forget that the American Revolution was a momentous, wonderful event in which a small band of colonists, of colonial subjects, rose up and demanded the right to have sovereignty over their own resources, their taxes, their products, their wealth. That is, their nation. They demanded the right to be a sovereign nation against British colonialism. George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Benjamin Franklin, thousands of others whose names are inscribed in, in the uh, history of this country, stood up and fought against precisely the British colonial approach that George Bush has embraced today. Well, how is it then that a nation which was founded in an anti-colonial struggle would today become the enforcer of this colonialism? How is it that we Americans, we American patriots, we American nationalists, who should have as our ideal the founding fathers of the American system, are instead cheering a president who's taken on all the attributes of the pathetic British monarch George III, who we fought against to establish this country? How could that have happened? And how could we Americans be so foolish as to spend our time in front of television waving American flags, praising this man who's spitting on our national legacy. Well, I'm going to say something that's very controversial. It's going to get me in trouble with certain people. But I think they need to think about this. And that is, 
George Bush is not an American patriot. George Bush is the exact opposite of an American patriot. He is a Harrimanite. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, what in the world is a Harrimanite? Obviously, I assume that you'll figure out that it's someone who's not a patriot. But let's take a look at this phenomenon, because if you want to understand how we have reversed our historic role as being a beacon of hope to the world, to anti-colonial struggles everywhere, to the point of today being an oppressor, you have to understand how this faction, which is the Anglo-American faction, has usurped the institutions of this country to the point that we have an almost unbroken string of Harrimanites, of British oligarchs, since the assassination of President Kennedy. And in fact, even before that, going back to the period of the end of World War II. And in fact, it goes back before that. Let's start by looking at one of Bush's role models, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was not really this great heroic figure on the white horse who was going out in the battle, leading the country, saving the forests, and doing all these things that, that you've been told. He was really, at heart, a pro-British racist. His model for the United States was to have the Americans assume the mantle that the British were losing. Because after all, Great Britain was becoming a second-rate power in 1900, at the time in which Roosevelt rose to be the president of the United States. And by the way, he became president when a real nationalist, a real patriot, William McKinley, was assassinated. Roosevelt's model was to extend the American sphere of influence, to grab whatever we wanted in Latin America. And he saw as his, his uh, uh, goal the triumph of the white race. Let me read a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, the hero, one of the heroes of George Bush. He said, this is a quote, all the great masterful races have been fighting races. And the minute that a race loses the hard fighting virtues, then no matter what else it may retain, no matter how skilled in commerce or finance, in science or art, it has lost its proud right to stand as the equal of the best. When he's talking about the fighting race, he's talking about white Anglo-Saxons. He was a leader in the fight to restrict immigration to this country. Most Americans understand that one of the things that made this country great was the idea of the melting pot. That people from any country in the world who were oppressed, who lacked economic opportunity, could come to this country. Well, here's what Teddy Roosevelt thought about that. He wanted strict immigration quotas, especially against the Chinese. And what he said in reference to Chinese immigration is that democracy, with the clear instinct of race selfishness, saw the race foe and kept out the dangerous alien. The race foe he's talking about were the Chinese who were coming to this country at the turn of the century. Teddy Roosevelt brought to prominence this point of view of the British or the, the Anglo-Saxon white racism. And Teddy Roosevelt's portrait proudly hangs behind George Bush's desk. Now, it's not simply Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt represents one side of it. But what is a Harrimanite? Let's get to the heart of the matter. Some of you know, may know from your history the name Edward H. Harriman. He's not exactly a positive figure. He may be today in the era of Michael Milkins and the junk bond deals and the explosion of debt on Wall Street. But Edward H. Harriman was known in his day as one of the robber barons. He was the man who built Union Pacific Railroad in a very brutal fashion. He was a partner with the old John D. Rockefeller at Standard Oil in setting up the railroad rates to favor the large oil companies. And anyone who got in their way in typical British free trade fashion, they would crush. 
Now, he had a son, a very famous son, named Averill Harriman. And Averill Harriman put his stamp on this century. Averill just died a few years ago. But during his career, he served in numerous government positions in the financial world, on Wall Street. He was a powerful figure. And around him were other powerful figures who have dominated the policy establishment of this country for most of the 20th century, with some exceptions, some notable exceptions. John Kennedy was not a Harrimanite, and he had to fight them because they tried to take over his administration. Roosevelt was not a Harrimanite, although the first eight years of his administration was dominated by this crowd. But other than that, the Harrimanites have had their way for most of the century. Now, what do they stand for? First of all, they believed in the unity of the Anglo-American, uh, uh, the Anglo-American should dominate. They believed there should be a unity that would be unbroken. In that sense, they were Anglophiles. They loved Britain. Uh, secondly, from the start, they were racists. The Harriman family set up something called the Eugenics Record Office. Now, eugenics is a fancy word for something that is known as race science. And what eugenicists do is try to prove that genetically, blacks are inferior to whites. This is constantly discredited, and yet in periods of crisis, it once again emerges as a so-called scientific study. The Harriman family set up an office in Cold Spring Harbor, New York, to house documents and studies of racists who spent a large amount of money to try and prove that not only are blacks genetically inferior, but Italians, Spanish, Greeks are genetically inferior, that Jews are genetically inferior, that Russians are genetically inferior, and so on. And if you remember the quote I just read from Teddy Roosevelt, the Harriman family was the leading fun funder of the anti-immigration fight in the period after World War I, the attempt to try and keep people from the rest of the world out of the United States. Now, there's another interesting factor about the Harrimans. That is that they have always believed in the idea of the necessity for a geopolitical deal between the Anglo-Americans on the one hand and Russia on the other. And this is extremely important because this crowd, this Harriman crowd, single-handedly saved Lenin's Bolshevik regime in 1920 and 21 when the Bolsheviks were in danger of losing a civil war and when they were in danger of having starvation wipe out their gains in the revolution. It was Averill Harriman himself who went over and negotiated the trade deals. His negotiating partner and some of this was Felix Dzerzhinsky, the man who set up the Cheka which was the predecessor to the KGB, that is the Russian secret intelligence agency, which under Stalin murdered millions of Russians. This was the negotiating partner for Averill Harriman. This agreement with the Russians was run out of an office at 120 Broadway, and there were a number of companies involved in working together to try and keep the Bolsheviks in power, that is to keep Lenin and then later Stalin in power one of the firms involved in this was Guarantee Trust Company, the bank of J.P. Morgan on Wall Street. Now, there's another side to this. At the same time they were supporting the Bolsheviks, the Harriman family business enterprises were also financing the Nazis. Now, on the one hand, that shouldn't be too surprising because Harriman's commitment to eugenics means that he was very sympathetic to Hitler's notion of a master race. And it's not surprising either that the recipient of an award given by the Harriman family in 1932 for genetic research was a man named Ernst Rudin. Ernst Rudin later became Hitler's race minister, and he drafted the laws used to kill the Jews in the concentration camps. A man who was given an award in 1932 by Averill Harriman's mother. Now, it's not just that they were sympathetic on these racial questions. The Harrimans were also involved in a bank called Union Bank, 
And this bank was owned by a German bank controlled by a famous German industrialist and financier named Fritz Thiessen. And Thiessen was a major contributor to Hitler from 1923 on. That is, the Thiessen interests who owned the bank, which was, whose subsidiary was the Harriman Bank in the United States, was funding Hitler to the tune of millions of marks. After the war, Fritz Thiessen wrote a book, and the title was, I Paid Hitler. Other members of the board of Union Bank, besides three Thiessen representatives, were Roland Harriman, the younger brother of Averill, and Prescott S. Bush, the father of our president of the United States, George Bush. Now let's investigate the connection between the Harrimans and Bush. That connection, plain and simple, is found in a crypt in New Haven, Connecticut, called the Skull and Bones Society, a secret, oh-so-secret society, which inducts only 15 or so people every year, the creme de la creme of the Yale University students. Yale, of course, is historically been a blue blood university, which has provided generations of leaders. And the top people who are picked to become the elite in this country are selected to become members of Skull and Bones. Let's just take a look for a moment at the Skull and Bones class of 1917. It's a very interesting year. That year, its members included Prescott S. Bush. Edward Roland Harriman, the younger brother of Averill, a man named Henry Neal Mallon. Now, he's a very interesting character. He was a top advisor to George Bush when George Bush set up his oil companies in Texas. And he was so close to Bush that Bush named his son Neal Mallon Bush, after this skull and bonesman, this colleague of his father's. Neal Bush, you may remember, if you think hard, you may remember, was the person who was about to become the poster boy for the SNL crisis, the son of George Bush, who through Silverado savings and loan cost the nation about $1.2 billion, which many people forgot about when the Gulf War started. But Neil Bush, Neil Mallon Bush, was named for this partner uh, of the Harrimans, a Skull and Bones Class of 17 member. And then there's another one named Knight Woolley, this is an interesting character. He was on the board of Guarantee Bank, which was the Morgan Bank, when they were financing the Bolsheviks in the early 20s. He later became a director of the Federal Reserve Board. All of these four people, Prescott Bush, Roland Harriman, Henry Neal Mallon, and Knight Woolley, became directors of a company called W.A. Harriman, which was an investment bank in New York City which later became Brown Brothers Harriman, very famous investment, private investment bank. It was through these networks that the Harriman crowd, with Averill, the senior partner, Roland, Prescott Bush, and others, controlling finance in this country through Guarantee Bank, which later became Morgan Guarantee, controlling an aspect of national policy through the Federal Reserve and so on, they also controlled raw materials through various relations through cartels. And their policy was to build up a global financial and political empire. Now, I'll just run through a couple examples of what these people did to give you a sense of how they did put their stamp on the 20th century. Before World War II, first of all, they were the ones who helped protect the Bolsheviks when the Bolsheviks were in trouble. They helped finance the Nazis. In the late 30s, these were the people who were the spokesmen for funding Stalin, even while Stalin entered in a treaty agreement with Adolf Hitler. These are the people who backed the Lend-Lease agreements that enabled the Russians to fight in World War II. Toward the end of the war, these were the people who negotiated the Yalta agreements. In fact, Averill Harriman was with Roosevelt who by the time Roosevelt got to Yalta in 1945, Roosevelt was very weak, very sick. And Harriman was the one who was cutting the deal with Churchill and Stalin. You remember the Yalta deal. That's the one that gave Eastern Europe 
to the Russians. That was the way that the Harriman crowd figured that they could maintain this global alliance, by making that kind of concession. And in return, they wanted to be able to get into Russia financially and into Russia to take over some of the raw materials. Now, after the war, these people had brought in a few others and became a larger group, which was basically recently called in a book, the wise men. These are the people who dominated post-war US policy. One of them is named Dean Acheson, another Yale graduate, but Acheson wasn't good enough to get into skull and bones. But he was an architect of Harry Truman's foreign policy. He's known today for one event in particular, which is that it was Dean Acheson who convinced Truman that the United States should stop backing Chiang Kai-shek and instead let Mao and the communists come to power in China. That is the Harriman crowd. Dean Acheson, working with General Marshall and a few others, were convinced that Chiang Kai-shek was too much of a nationalist, that he would not give over his raw material rights to Morgan Bank, to Chase Manhattan Bank, and others. And as a result, they made the recommendation that we cut off arms supplies to Chiang Kai-shek. We cut off credit to Chiang Kai-shek. And that enabled Mao and his bunch of murderers to march into power in China in October 1949. So already we have them backing the Bolsheviks, backing Hitler, and backing Mao. Now there's another one of these wise men who was actually Yale class of 1918, who was a skull and bones man in 1918, named Robert Lovett. He's not as well known. He should be known for two reasons. First, his family was business partners with the Baker family of James A. Baker III, our Secretary of State. It was his family that came down to Texas to run the Harriman family interest, Union and Pacific Railroad. It was Edgar Lovett from his family who helped found Rice University and was the first president of that university. And Robert Lovett was one of the wise men out of Skull and Bones. Lovett was the Secretary of Defense during the Korean War. And it was Lovett and Acheson who convinced Harry Truman to fire General Douglas MacArthur at the point at which MacArthur said, if we want to win the Korean War, we have to go after China. We have to cross the Yalu River. And Lovett and Acheson, in the tradition of the Bonesmen and the Harrimanites, instead sided with, Ma with Mao and had MacArthur fired. And as a result, we had a stalemate in Korea. Now, during much of that time, Averill Harriman was the ambassador to Russia. Now, shortly after that, Prescott Bush, who never was quite as prominent, never quite as powerful, Prescott became the senator from Connecticut. This crowd continued to shape policy. It was this group that claimed that we should have detente with Khrushchev when he came to power and when he denounced Stalinism, that Khrushchev is a reformer, that he's someone we can work with. In fact, the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of the Kennedy years was negotiated by Averill Harriman. And this Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was an attack on the development of nuclear weapons. And had we fully abided by it, the Russians would have outstripped us because they would have cheated, while we would have completely shut down uh, advances in nuclear technology after 1962. That was negotiated by Averill Harriman. Now, they brought in another junior, junior partner shortly after that, a man named Henry A. Kissinger, who is a Harrimanite and who is himself a British agent, as I'll explain in a moment. But Kissinger became one of the most important people in this grouping to carry out the transition from the post-war period in the 50s of the Harriman crowd to the Bush administration today. Kissinger was the person who replaced Averill Harriman as the negotiator in Vietnam, the American peace negotiator, who extended the war for five years while he claimed that he and Nixon had a secret plan for peace, during which time thousands of Americans were killed and many tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, were wounded or uh, injured or impaired for life. Kissinger brought with him 
another aspect of this British approach, the idea of the balance of power, the idea that you cannot have morality in foreign policy, what you must have is power politics. Again, the idea might makes right. The idea that underlies the, the old Roman Empire, the British Empire, and today this new world order of George Bush. That you can't worry about truth or goodness, it's power that counts. And this is a pagan doctrine. It's a doctrine which denies that there's any higher power in earth. Now, Kissinger, during his period of time, was responsible for a number of things. Remember, he was the person who negotiated originally the SALT agreement and the, the test bans, or the, the arms control agreements, rather, with Brezhnev. He was also the man who opened ties with Mao during the Nixon administration. Another central aspect of Kissinger's policy was no development for the third world, that third world countries must kneel to the International Monetary Fund. Kissinger's belief, which he stated, was that nothing important ever happened in the South, that is the Southern Hemisphere, and he attempted to make sure that it never did. In 1982, Kissinger gave a speech at Chatham House, which is the headquarters of British intelligence, and he admitted to being a British agent. He said he worked from British foreign office papers the whole time he was Secretary of State. He said, and I quote from Kissinger's speech, I kept the British foreign office better informed than I did the American State Department. That's what Kissinger said personally about his treachery. It shouldn't be surprising to find that Kissinger was a vehement opponent of the world outlook of Lyndon LaRouche who is attempting to put forward a, an idea for reorganization of the monetary system, for global development in the tradition of the American system. All the while, Kissinger instead was attempting to crush the developing sector and attempting to cut a deal with Moscow in the tradition of the Haramanites. It was Kissinger, later working through Bush, who backed Gorbachev and who said Gorbachev is the great reformer. He's the great hope for the future. It was Kissinger who sent his associates, Scowcroft and Eagleburger, to China to propitiate the butchers of Tiananmen Square, Deng Xiaoping. In the same way Acheson backed Mao, Kissinger backed Mao, and then his crowd backed Deng Xiaoping and their killers. It was the Kissinger crowd who ran the Iran-Contra affair through Kissinger's former deputy, Robert McFarlane. It was Kissinger who said, God may not forgive me for this, but I like Hafez al-Assad. And it was Kissinger who said the U.S. should have an alliance with Syria. And it was Kissinger's fat sidekick, Lawrence Eagleburger, the number two man at the State Department, who went to Syria to cut the deal which brought Syria in on this coalition. And it's Kissinger who still dominates the Bush administration, along with George himself through his other sidekick, Brent Scowcroft, Eagleburger, and others. And it's this crowd that's drafting the new world order, and Bush is functioning as, in his role as continuing the Harrimanite approach, this time with the belief that because the Russians can no longer carry out opposition, that now the Anglo-American world order can be imposed. And Kissinger had some comments on this the other day, on the question of the balance of power. And it's worth listening to these words to see why it is that they fear LaRouche and why it is they fear the idea of morality in politics. Kissinger said that the deepest challenge to America, this was in an, an editorial on February 23rd in the Houston Chronicle, the deepest challenge to America will be philosophical how to define order in the new world order. History so far has shown us only two roads to international stability, domination or equilibrium. We have neither the resources for domination nor is such a course compatible with our values. So we are brought back to a concept maligned in much of America's intellectual history, the balance of power, Kissinger's personal favorite view, which he borrowed or stole from the British. He said, and I continue, there is no escaping the irony that our triumph in the Cold War has projected us into a world 
where we must operate by maxims that historically have made Americans uncomfortable. To many Americans, the most objectionable feature of the balance of power is its apparent moral neutrality. Well, he's lying there. What he should have said is that it's based on an absence of morals. And he goes on to say that the United States must be the guarantor of a balance of power. And he explains what he means. He means a world in which Syria, Iran, and Iraq are pitted against each other in the Middle East, with none of them strong enough to shape the, the political geometry, but being just strong enough to fight each other. In Asia, he says, we must have Russia, China, and Japan pitted against each other. And of course, Kissinger has special hatred for Germany. And it's his hope that the Anglo-American financial power through the city of London can prevent Germany from industrializing Eastern Europe, which is the proposal that was drafted by Lyndon LaRouche long before the Berlin Wall fell. And this is the outlook of Bush today, this balance of power. This is the outlook of the New World Order. It is a new British empire. Bush thinks it's an improved version. But it's also a new Roman empire. It's a monstrosity based on loot, based on murder, as were the Roman and British empires. It's based on a pagan rejection of morality, and instead the substitution of the idea that might makes right. This is a philosophy that was ab abhorrent to our founding fathers. They were willing to give up their lives, their fortunes, to fight against that conception. And yet, many of those today who are cheering Bush see themselves as, as people continuing this tradition, the, the true American tradition. I think that they owe it to past generations. They owe it to their families, many of whom were immigrant families, to investigate what I've explained in the course of this presentation, that they owe it to their children and to the posterity, the hopeful future of this country, to discover how it is that Bush represents an alien presence, alien in the sense that it's a rejection of all that this country has stood for positively that Bush is a traitor against what this country was created to represent. The New World Order must not be allowed to come into existence. It's a New World Order that's been responsible, or the, the ideas behind this New World Order have been responsible for the most heinous crimes committed against mankind. As we've seen, the Harrimans themselves the Harrimanites help bring to power and keep in power Lenin and his secret police apparatus, Stalin, the Nazis, Mao, Hafez al-Assad, and these are the people. This is the, the conception of this new world order, and that if we're powerful enough, we can make it work. And it's implemented over the bodies of children throughout the developing sector who are only asking for the same birthright that we in America have taken for granted. That is the great tragedy of George Bush, and even more so, the tragedy of the popularity of George Bush. Lyndon LaRouche once said that Bush has a popularity which is a mile wide, but a micron deep. We've seen that before. Last summer, his support fell below the 50% mark for a while. Even today, while 85% of the American people are cheering the military victory over Saddam Hussein, only 42%, according to a poll that came out today, support his domestic policies. And it's probably only that high because people have not been investigating what they are. So at this point, we're at a critical moment in American history. Either our country will become an enforcer of a genocidal world order modeled on the British system, which has contempt for those in the developing sector, which has already decided that they will not develop 
that they will become breeding grounds of disease and famine and graveyards for the hopes and dreams of the children that live there. Or else the United States can again become the kind of nation that our founding fathers were committed to, the kind of nation represented by the policies of Lyndon LaRouche, the kind of nation that will not tolerate a George Bush or a Henry Kissinger. And I'll leave you with this thought. When Ronald Reagan ran for president in 1976 and again in 1980, he said, never again will we allow a Henry Kissinger to control foreign policy. And yet what we've had since 1983 has been the new return of the Harrimanites in the person of Kissinger and in the person of Bush. This is a disgrace, and as Americans, we should not and cannot tolerate it. Thank you.